Okay, back again. Well, if that last story didn't put you to sleep, this one certainly will. It's titled, um, I should say, this is uh, September 1881 in Tasmania. It's titled, A Remarkable Case, and it refers to a trial and a sad ending again, unfortunately. An extraordinary trial with a tragic ending has occurred at Launceston. Patrick Linane was a farmer at Table Cape on the northwest coast of Tasmania. Mr. Paul Freeman, a minister, whether Methodist or not, is open to dispute, was a neighbour of his and on one occasion lent him the sum of five pounds ten shillings. Paul Freeman was grazing cattle on Linane's farm. When Paul Freeman removed his cattle, he also took away two steers which had been Linane's. The latter recovered the steers and immediately prosecuted Paul Freeman for cattle stealing. Paul Freeman produced a receipt alleged to be signed by Linane, acknowledging the payment of £2.10 for each steer. It was not pretended that any money actually passed, but it was alleged through nothing, though nothing to that effect was shown on the face of the document, that the steers were given as a set-off to a debt of £5.10. Two witnesses, Dowling and Applestall, remember that name, Applestall, attested to the signature, and together with Mrs. Paul Freeman, swore they witnessed Lenane sign it. Lenane pr pronounced the receipt a forgery, but Paul Freeman was acquitted. Paul Freeman next, com next prosecuted Lenane for perjury. The evidence then disclosed was of a different complexion altogether. Mrs. Paul Freeman contradicted herself, and Dowling and Applestall both stated that they had sworn falsely before in order to save Paul Freeman from disgrace, but that their consciences smote them on seeing the charge of perjury laid against Lenane. They averred that they had attested the signature at Paul Freeman's request in the absence, absence of Lenane. After the initiation of the perjury charge, they had consulted a priest who had advised them to tell the truth. It also oozed out in evidence that Paul Freeman had officiated at the marriage of Lenane and had in his possession the signature of the latter in the marriage register. The signature to the receipt closely resembled that in the register, but differed from Lenane's ordinary signature. It also appeared that Paul Freeman had had previous cattle quarrels and had on such occasions produced disputed documents. However, Lenane was found guilty and sentenced to 18 months imprisonment Applestall was then charged with perjury and committed for trial. He and Lenane, handcuffed together, were led away to the police van. During the journey to jail, Lenane exclaimed that there could not be a God in heaven, or he, Lenane, would have obtained justice against Paul Freeman. The next thing heard was the report of an explosion, and Lenane was found to have shot himself dead with a revolver that he had concealed about him the whole of the trial. The case against Applestall is yet to be heard. The prosecution against Lenane is remarkable for its extraordinary evidence, its still more extraordinary verdict, and the tragic ending of this strangely convicted person. Now, I do have a follow-up to that, which covers the same story slightly differently. So this one uh, says the tragic incident was unprecedented in the history of the colony and will long be remembered from the peculiar circumstances connected to it. Now, I'm just going to skip this because we've done some of this before. He was sentenced by uh, his honour, Mr Justice Dobson, to 18 months imprisonment with hard labour. It now transpires that during the whole of that long and weary trial and while the prisoner was receiving his sentence, he stood facing the judge and jury with a loaded revolver conce concealed on his person, with which he deliberately blew his brains out a few minutes after leaving the precincts of the courthouse. Upon his removal from the dock after receiving his sentence, Lenane appeared to feel his position very keenly, and during a short detention in the waiting cell below was crying and bemoaning his fate. When the time arrived for removing him with the other prisoners to the jail, he gave a man a shilling to send a telegram to his wife at Table Cape, conveying the result of the trial. He was then handcuffed to William Applestall, 
the man who had been that day committed for trial for perjury on the same case and placed in a car with the other prisoners. The man was handcuffed by the left hand, his right being consequently free. They say car here, but they don't mean a motor car. Not in 1881. The Nain was being was handcuffed by the left hand, his right being consequently free. The car proceeded at a walking pace through the invalid, invalid depot grounds, closely followed by Mr. Miller, under jailer, and Constable Leslie of the Territorial Police. Upon arriving opposite the quarters of Mr. Venus, the overseer, a report was heard, but as it was not a loud one, and there was no suspicion as to his real cause, it was thought to have been occasioned by a cracker or squib. A second or two afterwards, however, Applestall called out, My mate's dead! And Mr. Miller at once looked into the car and saw the body of Lenane supported by Applestall, a six-chamber breech-loading revolver being in the dead man's hand and blood issuing from his mouth. The weapon was at once secured by Mr. Miller, who found the remaining five chambers loaded. The body was taken to the jail and subsequently examined by Drs. Maddox and C.A. Stewart. The name appeared to have destroyed himself by placing the revolver in his mouth and the ball passing after passing through the pallet lodged in the base of the brain, death being instantaneous. <coughs> William Applestall states that prior to the rash act being committed, Lenane had conversed with him, and amongst other things he said, I do not believe there is a God in heaven or I would have got justice today. Another remark was, if I were to die, I'd haunt, I'd haunt Palfreyman. Shortly afterwards, Applestall heard the report and felt the body leaning heavily upon him, which, he induced, which induced him to call out as related above. He did not notice Lenane with the revolver prior to hearing the report. An inquest upon the body will be held at noon today. The result of this case shows the necessity for some alteration being made in dealing with prisoners on bail, and no doubt some steps will now be taken to have them searched before being placed in the dock. In the present instance, next page, the prisoner surrendered to his bail in the court and at once walked into the dock, the loaded weapon being upon him all day. It is scarcely necessary to dilate upon what might be the consequences to judge, jurymen or witnesses if desperate men are allowed to take loaded revolvers with them into court and retain possession of them during their trial. Certainly was a memorable case. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned the name William Applestall and I found another reference to William Applestall. I was curious what happened to him. Now, I didn't find a lot, but there was a discussion here of uh, an old building in the area that was taken down, and in the memory of an uh, older person here, much later on, he remembered that the original portion of the later, much extended premises was erected, so far as I remember, to the order of the late William Henry Aldacre of Avon West Burnie for his bullock driver, a man of austere character, William Applestall, who was the witness charged with perjury in that case. And that sort of led me to another reference to William Applestall. I was just curious about what happened to him afterwards. So this is uh, much later. This is 1926. But they are speaking of memories of the past here. Uh, William Applest Applestall, known as Hermit Applestall, would always camp with his teams of well-matched brindle bullocks as far away from the ordinary camping grounds as possible, hence he got the name The Hermit. He drove the team for the late Mr. William Henry Holdacre, who was mentioned in that previous. In build he was very tall and angular. Reports said he was seven foot high, but the stoop of the man shortened him considerably. Hermit, Applestall, was morose and made few friends. He had a young lad and a couple of dogs for company, and was very independent of assistance from other teams. In fact, he rarely needed it, for he never overloaded his team of really good bullocks. And after a especially hard day, he would stay in, camp, stay in camp and spell them for half a day. He did not tie himself to any fixed time, was never in a hurry, and no other team ever waited for him. I just thought that was an interesting follow-up on uh, Mr. Apple's stall. Um, yeah, 
So I'll leave that one there and uh, I'll see what else I can dig up.